Good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Mike Wallace. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History. And we, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know what we do, we do a whole variety of uh, public uh, events uh, dealing with the city's uh, past. You can find out all about what we do and what's up next on our website, the W's Gotham Center. Uh, dot, uh, org. Uh, our next session will be on June 15th, uh, and it'll be called Does Place Matter on the Lower East Side? And we're going to have two uh, community activists and two historians uh, delving into uh, the city's uh, past uh, and present. All right, now tonight we have a, a, a fabulous constellation uh, of people uh, addressing the intersection between the city's history uh, and it's poetry. Uh, and a lot of people have uh, worked uh, with us on uh, putting this uh, stellar assemblage together. Uh, so I just want to thank, uh, first of all, our own uh, Suzanne Wasserman, who's the Associate Director of the Gotham Center. Uh, where is Suzanne? Uh, there she is. And, and uh, the uh, folks at City Lore, Steve Zeitlin, Marcy Rieben, and Hiroko Kazama, where are they? Are they here? Yes. Uh, and um, uh, I should tell you that this is really the kickoff of a vast event, uh, the uh, People's Poetry Gathering. And Bob Holman, who will uh, be up first, uh, will in fact uh, give you a quick intro to what's happening with this material uh, on the table outside. Now, let me tell you the uh, order of, uh, of uh, sumptuous battle here this evening. Uh, we have uh, seven uh, folks. Uh, six of them are going to be uh, presenting other uh, poets or groups of poets, uh, and then we'll have one poet uh, giving you uh, a, a bit of his own work. Uh, the uh, presenters will each have 15 minutes, uh, and I will hold them ruthlessly to that because we have a great deal to uh, get through. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, and uh, our, our uh, uh, brief poet reading, uh, we will have two brief uh, films uh, on... Um, uh, Allen Ginsberg that uh, were uh, each of them three minutes uh, long. They'll be our uh, dessert. After that, assuming we have uh, energy and time, uh, we will invite your questions, comments, uh, and the like. So I'm going to, in fact, tell you about who all the people are uh, quickly, because, uh, in fact, it's, uh, most of this is written down somewhere, uh, and give you the uh, order uh, of, uh, of uh, flow. So, uh, Bob Holman is going to uh, deal with uh, Walt Whitman, uh, and Bob was recently uh, dubbed a member of the Poetry Pantheon by the New York Times Magazine and featured in a Henry Louis Gates Jr. profile in The New Yorker. He produced the United States of Poetry for PBS, which features over 60 poets, including Derek Walcott, Rita Dove, Cheslo Milos, Lou Reed, and former President Jimmy Carter, as well as rappers, cowboy poets, American Sign Language poets, and slammers. David Levering Lewis is the Julius Silver University Professor and Professor of History at New York University. He will be uh, treating Claude McKay, uh, David Lewis has twice won the Pulitzer Prize for biography uh, for W.E.B. Du Bois, Biography of a Race, 1868 to 1919, and W.E.B. Du Bois, The Fight for Equality in the American Century, 1919 to 1963. He is also the author of When Harlem Was in Vogue and the Harlem Renaissance Reader. Uh, American Communist Poets uh, will be the focus for Al Philrace, who is the Kelly Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania and Faculty Director of the Kelly Writers House. He is a specialist in modern and contemporary American poetry and the literary politics of the American 1930s and 1950s. He is the author of Modernism from Right to Left and is currently writing a literary history of the idea of modernism in the American 1950s called the 50s-30s. 
Philip Lopate uh, will tackle Frank O'Hara and the New York School of Poets. Uh, Philip currently holds the Adams Chair at Hofstra University, where he is professor of English. He is an essayist, a novelist, a poet, and a memoirist, and his latest book is Waterfront, A Journey Around Manhattan. Uh, <clears throat> Marianne Moore will uh, be the subject of Elisa New, who is professor of English at Harvard University and author of The Lion's Eye, Poetic Experience, American Sight, and the Regenerate Lyric, Theology and Innovation in American Poetry. Uh, then uh, Carmen Buyosa uh, will uh, address uh, a series of Spanish-speaking poets. Carmen is one of Mexico's leading novelists, poets, and playwrights. Currently, she is CUNY's distinguished lecturer at City College in the Foreign Languages Department. Her latest book of poems, Salto de Mantarea y Otros Dos, was named the best book of poetry published in Mexico for 2004. Uh, in the uh, interests of full disclosure, I should say that on uh, May Day, uh, Carmen and I celebrated our first wedding anniversary. Uh, thank you. Uh, and um, finally, uh, uh, um, uh, Iwan Hewitt, uh, who won the crown at the National Estedford in 1990 with his sequence of poems in English called Sparks. Uh, he has published numerous collections, one of which Far Rockaway appeared bilingually, uh, and he will read from his own work in both Welsh uh, and English after that, the aforementioned film. So as you see, uh, we have a, uh, a full program and a spectacular uh, uh, array of people. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to be a stern taskmaster and keep our folks to 15 minutes uh, each, except for Bob who gets a little extra time to tell you about I'm the totally People's kidding. Poetry Gathering. Uh, you can sit at, at uh, the table in front of your mic, or you can come up here uh, and use the podium where I can chastise you if you run over it more easily. Thanks, Mike. What a way to get this going, huh? This is uh, either the, uh, the opening of the People's Poetry Gathering or the second preliminary opening of the People's Gathering because last night here in this space, Robert Bly gave an astonishing performance, what's called the keynote. Um, I guess he had, he unlocked it with his keynote last night. Um, and tonight, all kinds of poems about uh, New York. And tomorrow at the UN, we will have our third opening event in the afternoon. That will be a, um, an event dedicated to the Poetries of Endangered Languages, which is the new initiative of the People's Poetry Gathering. You know, there are plenty of... Uh, people out there advocating for the loss of species and, and uh, flora and fauna on the endangered list, but who's to speak for the systems of consciousness, the cultures that are lost with, when languages go? Well, of course, it's gotta be the poets. So uh, that will be one of the features of this year's uh, um, poetry gathering which will take place here on Saturday from noon until 10 o'clock. Lots of music and a uh, festival within a festival. Harp song, Celtic languages and musics here. Thus, uh, Ewan is here to, uh, to represent the great comeback of the Welsh language against big bully English. And uh, we'll have a, a lot of his helpmates, including at the Bowery Poetry Club uh, tomorrow night, Black 47, the sensational Irish rock and uh, culturally uh, correct and politically correct and in every other way is totally incorrect uh, gang of musicians. Edgar Allan Poe at the graveyard at midnight, prayers and poetry at the Bowery Mission Sunday morning. It's too much to mention, so I'll shut up and urge you to read it for yourselves and join us at the People's Poetry Gathering. This is the fourth time this has happened. We're uh, um, oral poets and text poets gather together. The traditions of the world's poetry collide. What better way to start this event than with the great papa of, uh, of US poetry and certainly 
the saint of uh, New York City, Walt Whitman, who wants to remind you all that he walked these streets just as you do, except he didn't have a cell phone. Yes, could we, could we uh, in fact, if there's any still uh, cell phones that are operational, could we throttle them? Thank you. Bonk. Okay. <laughs> Walt would have had a, a cell phone, and later on we'll find out what he would have done with it. I'm going to uh, start off with a, a, a piece. I'm just going to read uh, sections of most of, of a couple of poems. A, a Broadway pageant, which is something that if you do take that uh, the train up to to. To, on, to the 7th Avenue line up here to 34th Street, which is how I made it, you immediately know what he's talking about with the Broadway pageant. When million-footed Manhattan unpent descends to her pavements, when the thunder-cracking guns arouse me with the proud roar I love, when the round-mouthed guns out of the smoke and smell I love split their salutes, when the fire-flashing guns have fully alerted me and heaven clouds canopy my city with a delicate thin haze, when gorgeous the countless straight stems, the forests at the wharves thicken with colors, when every ship richly dressed carries her flag at the peak, when pennants trail and street festoons hang from the windows, when Broadway is entirely given up to foot passengers and foot standers, when the mass is densest, when the facades of the houses are alive with people, when eyes gaze riveted tens of thousands at a time, when the guests from the islands advance, when the pageant moves forward visible, when the summons is made, when the answer that waited thousands of years answers, I too, Arising, answering, descend to the pavements, merge with the crowd, and gaze with them. So that's a section of uh, a Broadway pageant uh, by Walt Whitman. Yeah, you can tell how he was doing it. I mean, he was Walt Whitman as as I am Bob Holman, and there is Philip Lopate and Allen Ginsberg and Frank O'Hara, there is no longer any uh, John Crow Ransoms or William Cullen Bryants or Edgar Allan Poe's. You know, we're down to Bob and Walt at this point, you know. Um, down at the seashore, down there at, uh, at um, um, by the World Financial Center at the South Slip, you'll see a couple of uh, great poetry lines, um, what, how do you call it, in the ironwork of, uh, of the fence there that keeps you from getting on the yachts. <laughs> and uh, th I'm going to read uh, some of the lines here. The other poet who is recognized down there is Frank O'Hara. Are you gonna read that poem, Philip? No, but... No, it's, uh, what, I think it's, um, um, I cannot, even uh, love a blade of grass, referring to Whitman there, unless I know that there's a record store nearby or uh, a subway or some other sign that people do not entirely detest life. Detest isn't the right word, but I'll, I'll come up with it later. Anyway, here's, the, what, here's what Walt Whitman says down at the South Slip. City of ships. City of ships, oh, the black ships, oh, the fierce ships. Oh, the beautiful sharp-bowed steamships and sail ships. City of the world, for all races are here. All the lands of the earth make contributions here. City of the sea, city of hurried and glittering tides, city of wharves and stores, city of tall facades of marble and iron, proud and passionate city, meddlesome, mad, extravagant city. 
He's, he just he sounds so contemporary, doesn't he? And of course, he loves the idea of that. You know, we're reading him while he's laughing at us. I'm also reminded of, the, of Ted Berrigan, who was a Walt Whitman of his time, say 20 years ago, wandering the streets of the, the Lower East Side. He wrote a book, he wrote a dedication to uh, poets as well, to those who came after. It was called To the Poets of the Future. Remember, you did not write these poems. I did. He was talking to Walt or what. But there's another little poem that probably everyone that, uh, that looks through the titles is going to flip through and read, although it's not what you think it might be about. It's called The City of Orgies. City of Orgies, walks and joys. City whom that I have lived and sung in your midst will one day make you illustrious not the pageants of you, not your shifting tableaus, your spectacles repay me, not the interminable rows of your houses, nor the ships at the wharves, nor the processions in the streets, nor the bright windows with goods in them, nor to converse with learned persons or bear my share in the soiree or feast, not those, but as I pass, O Manhattan, your frequent and swift flash of eyes offering me love, offering response to my own. These repay me. Lovers, continual lovers, only repay me. So the, the orgy of the flirtatious, come on as Waltz celebrates cruising as one of the great attributes of uh, New York. So uh, what would it be if you were to, to, to Whitman without letting us all cross Brooklyn Ferry again with him? It's probably the poem that speaks best across the airs as the city that... Uh, you know, Bob Hirshon has a poem in the New York Epic, which is a poem that's been commissioned and is going to also be created by the audience uh, that comes to the People's Poetry Gathering. Everybody takes on a persona of the, some aspect of the city, a, a geography or a person or a time period or a building. And Bob Hirshon took on the... Uh, the lost waistlines and menus of all the restaurants that have closed where you can't go and get those delicious food there anymore. Um, just to remind you, of course, how th the great unfinishedness of our, of our fair and sometimes unfair city. You know, by the time you uh, finish the list of all the restaurants, they've got a whole new list. But uh, Walt is still crossing Brooklyn Ferry, even though it's not there anymore. And you can think of him every time you get across that bridge that makes the same route. Here's just some sections from this fantastic poem. Flood tide below me, I see you face to face. Clouds of the west, sun there half an hour high, I see you also face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes, how curious you are to me on the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross, returning home, are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore, years hence, are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose. The impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day, the simple, compact, well-joined scheme, myself disintegrated, everyone disintegrated, yet part of the scheme, 
the similitudes of the past and those of the future, the glories strung like beads on my smallest sights and hearings on the walk in the street and the passage over the river, the current rushing so swiftly and swimming with me far away, the others that are to follow me, the ties between me and them, the certainty of others, the life, love, sight, hearing of others. Others will enter the gates of the ferry and cross from shore to shore. Others will watch the sun of the flood tide. Others will see the shipping of Manhattan north and west and the heights of Brooklyn to the south and east. Others will see the islands large and small. Fifty years hence, others will see them as they cross, the sun half an hour high. A hundred years hence, or even so many hundred years Hence, others will see them, will enjoy the sunset, the pouring in of the flood tide, the falling back to the sea of the ebb tide. It avails not time nor place. Distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations hence. Just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt. Just as any of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, I was refreshed. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, I stood, yet was hurried. These and all else were to me the same as they are to you. I loved well those cities, loved well the stately and rapid river. The men and women I saw were all near to me, others the same, others who look back on me because I looked forward to them. The time will come, though I stop here today and tonight. What is it then between us? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not. Distance avails not, and place avails not. I too lived, Brooklyn of ample hills was mine. I too walked the streets of Manhattan Island and bathed in the waters around it. I too felt the curious, abrupt questionings stir within me. In the day among crowds of people, Sometimes they came upon me in my walks home late at night, or as I lay in my bed, they came upon me. I, too, had been struck from the float forever held in solution. I, too, had received identity by my body. That I was, I knew, was of my body, and what I should be, I knew I should be of my body. Walt Whitman. David Lewis. I wondered after I accepted uh, Mike Wallace's invitation why on earth I did. Uh, it was certainly, I thought, imprudent. Uh, it is true, though, that I assembled a, uh, a Harlem portable Renaissance reader, and I went back to it and I found there were quite a number of poems there and I thought I could well serve myself of them. Um, <clears throat> two, poet, two poets seem to me uh, to be especially uh, pertinent to uh, early New York. Uh, Langston Hughes, to be sure. But Claude McKay, I thought, uh, a name, perhaps still a household name, uh, but a man whose poetry, I think, is uh, seldom uh, evoked. Uh, and yet he was, one uh, remembers, in 1922, uh, the rage of New York with the publication of Harlem Shadows, a collection of his poems uh, which gathered together poems uh, uh, of his uh, native uh, Jamaica uh, and of uh, New England and indeed of New York, Harlem, Uptown, and uh, the village. <clears throat> One poem is, I think, well known. It's a poem that has so much energy and, and, and vim uh, that it uh, 
explains, it seems to me, uh, the Harlem Renaissance that begins but a few years uh, after uh, its publication. Uh, if we must die, if we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll, first, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. That poem, of course, <clears throat> Uh, res resonated against the, uh, the rafters of the House of Commons in the darkest days of the uh, Battle of Britain when Churchill, uh, unaware of the uh, ethnicity of the poet, uh, read that poem to a silent uh, House of Commons. Uh, but the people who are coming to Harlem uh, have that sense of willingness to, to risk, to move, uh, to come from the South, to come from the Caribbean. Uh, that poem really frames, I think, the uh, great black migration out of the South and the Antillean migration uh, to uh, this city and, and elsewhere. But coming to New York is not always uh, a, uh, a happy uh, result. And uh, in his poetry, McKay's uh, there is an oscillation between uh, the pastoral and uh, the, the dangers of, uh, of the urban. Uh, there's uh, an immigrant uh, Weltschmerz or nostalgia that he captures uh, wonderfully uh, in uh, this poem, The uh, Tropics in New York. Bananas ripe and green and ginger root, cocoa in pods and alligator pears, and tangerines and mangoes and grapefruit fit for the highest prize at parish fairs. Set in the window bringing memories of fruit trees laden by low singing rills and dewy dawns and mystical blue skies in benediction over none like hills. My eyes grew dim and I could no more gaze a wave of longing through my body swept, and hungry for the old familiar ways, I turned aside and bowed my head and wept. The city, with all its cruelty and its, uh, uh, its sight for uh, mobility and success, uh, McKay could capture quite wonderfully, but the um, sad tones, I think, uh, predominate. And in this uh, poem, The Desolate City, uh, dare I say there is really uh, an anticipation of Eliot's wasteland, The Desolate City. My city, my spirit, my spirit is a, is a pestilential city with misery triumphant everywhere, glutted with baffled hopes and human pity, Strange agonies make quiet lodgment there. Its sewers bursting ooze up from below and spread their loathsome substance through its lanes, flooding all areas with their evil flow and blocking all the motions of its veins. Its life is sealed to love or hope or pity. My spirit is a pestilential city. There was a time when, happy with the bards, the little children clapped their hands and laughed, and midst the clouds the glad winds heard their words and blew down all the merry ways to waft the music through the scented fields of flowers. Oh, sweet children's voices in those days before the fall of pestilential showers that drove them forth far from the city's ways. Now, never, never more, their silver ways will mingle with the golden of the birds. Harlem <clears throat> was a place 
uh, coming, uh, <coughs> assembling, as, uh, as McKay is writing. Uh, and he writes about it uh, just as it's being discovered by downtown. Uh, this is the Harlem that is soon to be the Harlem of the Cotton Club, of uh, high prancing people, uh, of exoticism, uh, the uh, Harlem of, uh, of primitivism, you would say. He didn't, he foresaw that, then he left, went to Russia, uh, <laughs> uh, wasn't happy there, but he was celebrated for a time. Um, but in the Harlem Dancer, he prefigures the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, cultural meld of exoticism and uh, primitivism uh, and uh, uh, racial specialness of, uh, of that uh, exploitative uh, and yet wonderfully uh, rich era, the Harlem Dancer. Applauding youth laughed with young prostitutes and watched her perfect half-clothed body sway. Her voice was like the sound of blended flutes blown by black players upon a picnic day. She sang and danced and gracefully and calm. The light gauze hanging loose about her form, to me she seemed a proudly swaying palm, grown lovelier for passing through a storm. Upon her swarthy neck, black, shiny curls, profusely fell, and tossing coins in praise, the wine-flushed, bold-eyed boys, and even the girls devoured her with their eager, passionate gaze. But looking at her falsely smiling face, I knew herself was not in that strange place. Langston Hughes needs no more introduction than would Duke Ellington. And Langston, the premier poet laureate of of the Renaissance, uh, the, the bard of Harlem. Langston was also the poet of, of migration uh, and of, uh, of uh, uh, acculturation. Uh, America seems especially timely now that immigration is very much in the forefront of our concerns, America. Little dark baby, little Jew baby, little outcast, America is seeking the stars, America is seeking tomorrow. You are America, I am America, America the dream, America the vision, America the star seeking I. Out of yesterday the chains of slavery, out of yesterday the ghettos of Europe, out of yesterday the poverty and pain of the old, old world, the building and struggle of this new one, we come, you and I seeking the stars, you and I. You of the blue eyes and of the blonde hair, I of the dark eyes and the crinkly hair, you and I offering hands, being brothers, being one, being America, you and I, and I, who am I? You know me. I'm Crispus Attucks, the Boston Tea Party, Jimmy Jones in the ranks of the last black troops marching for democracy. I'm Sojourner Truth preaching and praying for the goodness of this wide, wide land. Today's black mother bearing tomorrow's America. Who am I? You know me. Dream of my dreams. I am America. I am America seeking the stars. America. Hoping, praying, fighting, dreaming, knowing there are stains on the beauty of my democracy. I want to be clean. I want to grovel. No longer in the mire. I want to reach always after stars. Who am I? I am the ghetto child. I am the dark baby. I am you and the blonde tomorrow. And yet, and yet, I am my one sole self, America, seeking the stars. Um, with the uh, migration into the city and the cauldron of, uh, of uh, activity and culture and publication and music and commerce, um, the momentum seemed unstoppable uh, in New York and across the land. But uh, it ran out of fuel. In 1929, uh, the bottom dropped out. And Hughes wrote a poem that I think is not at all well known, uh, somewhat time bound, and yet it seems to me uh, so apt for that moment of aspirations balked as, uh, as the market collapsed and uh, the economy 
disaggregated. Advertisement for the Waldorf Astoria. It was published in 1929. Fine living a la carte. Listen, hungry eyes, listen, hungry ones. Look, uh, see what Vanity Fair says about the new Waldorf Astoria. All the luxuries of private home. Now won't that be charming when the last flop house has turned you down this winter? Furthermore, it is far beyond anything hitherto attempted in the hotel world. It costs $28 million. The famous Oscar Chirsky is in charge of banqueting. Alexandre Gastot is chef. It will be a distinguished background for society. So when you've got no place to go, homeless and hungry ones, choose the Waldorf as a background for your rags. Or do you still consider the subway after midnight good enough? Rumors. Take a room in the new Waldorf, you down and outers, sleepers in charity flop houses where God pulls a long face and you have to pray to get to bed. They serve swell board at the Waldorf Astoria. Look at this menu, will you? Gumbo Creole, crab meat and cassoulet, boiled brisket of beef, small onions and cream, watercrust salad, peach melba. Have lunch in this afternoon, all you jobless. Why not? Dine with some of the men and women who got rich off your labor, who clipped coupons with clean white fingers because your hands dug coal, drilled stone, sewed garments, poured steel to let other people draw dividends and live easy. Or haven't you had enough yet of the soup lines and the bitter bread of charity? Walk through Peacock Alley tonight before dinner and get warm. Anyway, you've got nothing else to do. All you families put out in the streets, apartments in the tower are only 10,000 a year, three rooms and two baths. Move in there until times get good and you can do better. 10,000 and one dollar are about the same to you, aren't they? Who cares about money with a wife and kids homeless and nobody in the family working? Wouldn't a duplex high above the street be grand with a view of the richest city in the world at your nose? A lease, if you prefer, or an arrangement terminable at will. Negroes. Oh, Lord, I done forgot Harlem. Say, you colored folks, hungry a long time in 135th Street, they got swell music at the Waldorf Astoria. It sure is a mighty nice place to shake hips in, too. There's dancing after supper in a big warm room. It's cold as hell on Lenox Avenue. All you've had all day is a cup of coffee, your pawn shops, your pawn shop overcoats, a ragged banner on your hungry frame. You know, downtown folks are just crazy about Paul Robeson. Maybe they'll like you too, black mob from Harlem. Drop in at the Waldorf this afternoon for tea. Stay to dinner. Give Park Avenue a lot of darky color, free for nothing. Ask the junior leaguers to sing a spiritual for you. They probably know him better than you do, and their lips won't be so chapped with cold after they step out of their closed cars in the undercover driveways. Hallelujah, undercover driveways. My soul's a witness for the Waldorf Astoria. Somewhat time-bound, some of these poems are, but they do seem to remind us of the New York in its better and uh, sadder times. Uh, and. Uh, it does perhaps uh, prefigure some times ahead for those who are not as fortunate as the very fortunate people who still go to the Waldorf Astoria. Thank you. <laughs> Al, still reason. Oh, there he is. I'm already here. <laughs> the other day, 77th graders from Houston, Texas showed up at the Kelly Writer's House in Philadelphia, and I was to teach them modern poetry in one hour. <laughs> and I lost my voice, so I apologize. It will probably keep me from going over 15 minutes. <laughs> Communist poets. Strange. Uh, Whitman and McKay and Hughes well-known. I hope, I wish McKay were better known, but still well-known. Uh, my three poets, and I'm only going to really talk about two, but I had a third, I want to just say his name, are Herman Specter, a household name, Herman Specter, 
Kenneth Fearing, and Ruth Lechlitner. Now, how many of you sophisticated Gothamites, devotees of the Gotham Center, know of the poetry, or just know the name of the poet, Herman Specter, raise your hand. Oh boy. How many of you, you sh there'll be a few people here, know of the poetry, or at least the name of Kenneth Fearing? Oh, bless you. And how many of you know of Ruth Lechlitner? I do. Did somebody raise their hand? Who is it? You get a, really? We need to talk. <laughs> you get a door prize. Why? Well, why are they unknown? This is the big question that a, a foolish scholar like myself has to ask and answer. Um, they were communists at some point. In two of the three cases, actual members of the party. Of course, Hughes was closely affiliated. McKay was a member of the Communist Party, I think, of Jamaica when he wrote the poem that Churchill then quoted. Churchill didn't know that either. <laughs> and Walt, Walt is an honorary communist. So, so the, this is all about communists. Marianne Moore? I don't think so. Um, they were communists, and then they were forgotten. So the question is, were they forgotten because they were communists? Were they forgotten in the 1950s because they had been communists in the late 20s and 30s? Or were they forgotten because, justifiably, they were forgotten because they were bad poets who had been put forward in the communist moment of the Depression and the Popular Front? And that's a question I ask. It's not a question I intend to answer um, other than by way of aesthetics. Kenneth Fearing, so nothing about Herman Specter other than that. I have a book of his poetry, which is rare enough, and if you're interested, I'll give it to you. Fearing had a view of modern bureaucracy that he put, a Kafkaesque view of modern bureaucracy that he put in his poems, and a kind of neo-Luddism, odd for a communist that he would hate machines. So he was an odd man out already. He thrived in the 20s and 30s, so he was a premature communist poet in the 20s. And then in the 40s and 50s, except for a brief moment when he had a big, big hit, a big book, a mystery novel, a thriller, um, he was broke and lonely. Typical of the three, actually. Uh, he was a wild man and didn't fit in with the slightly more formal communists who preceded him of an earlier generation. Here's a story. Floyd Dell of a previous communist generation, and Joe Freeman, also forgotten, two guys forgotten, were elders in the party, and they decided to challenge each other to look for the younger party guys, the younger party poets, and they invited six younger party poets, including, including Fearing, to a party um, at the home of, um, of Egmont Ahrens, who was... Um, an industrial designer, a man with money, and a new masses editor. Uh, the party took place on East 16th Street in Egmont's penthouse, and Fearing was invited. And at this party, Dell got up, as they did at communist party parties. So you didn't think they partied. <laughs> Dell recited Byron, Shelley, Keats, Wordsworth, and Millay from a chair, declaimed, and Freeman got up and he did Eliot, Pound, Cummings, and Yates. There's your Communist Party party. <laughs> then they turned to Fearing, who was already drunk and on his way to Drunker, and said, will you recite now? This was, I guess, a test of the new generation of Communist poets. And Fearing said, and I quote, oh shit. A profane groan, oh shit. Now for years the party tried to figure out what that meant. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, oh shit, and went into the kitchen for more gin. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time trying to interpret that oh shit. <laughs> it, I've concluded that it wasn't what Dell and Freeman thought, which was a rejection of his communist elders' interest in modernism and in Romanticism. Rather, he was very, 
Fearing was interested in both. Rather, it was a rejection, it was a sign that a new poetic left within the old left had been born. This is not the new left. Fearing died just before the rise of the new left, but a new left poetically within the old. And in general, this is the problem of readers and scholars who try to figure out the story of these communist modernists. Fearing's demotic, chatty, antic, digressive, and long-lined style, somewhere between Whitman and O'Hara, predated Ginsburg, but many argue made Ginsburg's style possible. Well, the poem I want to read by Fearing is my favorite of all. It's called Green Light, and it takes place in New York. And I think it's remarkable. Um, most of the lines have no subject, grammatical subject. That's all I'll tell you about the poet in advance. Green Light. Bought at the drugstore, very cheap, and later pawned. After a while, heard on the street, seen in the park. Familiar, but not quite recognized. Followed and taken home and slept with. Traded or sold or lost. Bought again at the corner drugstore, at the green light, at the patient's demand, at nine o'clock. Reread and memorized and rewound. Found unsuitable. Smashed, put together, and pawned. Heard on the street, seen in a dream, heard in the park, seen in the light of day, carefully observed one night by a secret agent of the Greek Hydraulic Mining Commission in plain clothes off duty. The agent, in broken English, took copious notes. Oh, there's a subject. Which he lost. Strange and yet not extraordinary, sad but true. And this is the, what I call the Steinian bridge of the poem. <laughs> True or exaggerated or true, as it is true that the people laugh and the sparrows fly, as it is exaggerated that the people change and the sea stays, as it is that the people go, as the lights go on and it is night and it is serious and just the same, as someone dies and it is serious and the same, as a girl knows and it is small and true, as the corner hardware clerk might know and it is true and pointless, as an old man knows and it is grotesque but true, as the people laugh, as the people think, as the people change, it is serious and the same, exaggerated or true. Bought at the drugstore down the street where the wind blows and the motors go by and it is always night or day. Bought to use as a last resort. Bought to impress the statuary in the park. Bought at a cut rate at the green light at nine o'clock. Borrowed or bought to look well, to ennoble, to prevent disease, to entertain, to have, broken or sold or given away used or forgotten or lost. The desperate, erratic, used up state of being that is typical of New York and also typical of being a member of the Communist Party that is always Fearing's topic um, is reproduced in the poem's very grammar. Um, the thing that is unsaid, the unsaid subject we think about constantly while the poem's going on. And you might think it's something that has to do with sexuality that he gets from the drugstore, but then there are some other reasons why it's not. We spend our time guessing at, we know, we know it by the ways in which it is an object, by the ways in which it is made an object. And of course, this is what great poets do. This is what poets do. They make the form of the poem do the work and thus they make us figure out what's going on. We think of communist poems as descriptive, denotative, insensitive to form, unlike modernism, and the, the work of people who equated aesthetics with fascist. But in fact, the communist poets I like were interested in aesthetics. Fearing is one of them. The second, more briefly, is Ruth Lechlitner. I think Ruth was a wonderful poet. No one's ever heard of her except for one person here and me. She complained in, an, in a review of Edna St. Vincent Millay that Millay's verse was insufficiently poetic, and this was at a time when Ruth admitted to being a Stalinist. In a poem called Of What Superb Mechanics, she began addressing the poem itself. 
of what superb mechanics are, of what superb mechanics are, the wheels of change, the cycle driven, and what equation for a star set us in motion, you and I, behold us as we multiply, here poetic form generates social change. The poet Wallace Stevens loved to read the poems of Ruth Lechlitner, the Stalinist. <laughs> Lechlitner hung out with a guy named Ronald Lane Latimer who was completely crazy and published books through the Alcestis Press in the 30s and he published Ruth's book Tomorrow's Phoenix, a wonderful book. And Lechlitner arranged for all of these radical poets books to be reviewed by the New York Herald Tribune because she hid her communism for her editor Arita Van Doren at Books and she was able to publish reviews of communist poets in that mainstream magazine, slightly left of center magazine. Well, I'm gonna conclude by reading a poem by Ruth Lechlitner. It's called Lines for an Abortionist's Office. It is a New York poem written in 1936 after Ruth's uh, harrowing experience in what passed for an abortion clinic, I suppose we would say now, then. It is written in prayer diction. It is written in a hymnal ballad by this communist feminist. And what it does, I think, most interestingly is that it enters into the political discourse about abortion by claiming the word life, which is capitalized in the poem life, for what we'd call the pro-choice side. Here's the poem and then I'll just have a, a comment about it and I'll, I'll be done. Lines for an abortionist's office. Close here thine eyes, O state. These are a communist using the word state, but he's, she's referring to the state, the United States that makes abortion illegal. Close here thine eyes, O state. These are thy guests who bring to gods with appetites grown great a votive offering. Know that they dare defy the words of law and priest. Better to let the unborn die than starve while others feast. The stricken flesh may be outraged and heal, but mind pain sharpened may yet learn to see thee plain, O state. Be blind, accept love's fruit, be sleek, fat, and lips sealed. Forget that life, avenging pain, will speak. Thrust deep the long curette. So obviously the hymnal ballad is bitterly ironized. She does what poets do. She took a form, a received form, and did her thing, expressed her political opinion through the turning of a form, a poetic form. Like speaking, as in speaking in this poem, not the fetus speaking, but the woman the state does not see. That's Ruth Lechlitner. Thank you very much. A group of poets, um, the center of whom would be Frank O'Hara, Kenneth Koch, John Ashbery, and James Schuyler, um, who came from elsewhere to New York City. Um, and a few older poets like uh, uh, Edwin Denby and Barbara Guest, and a few younger poets like uh, Ted Berrigan and Ron Padgett. Uh, I'm going to speak actually about two of these, uh, Frank O'Hara and Edwin Denby. I've often been struck by the fact that Frank O'Hara and Edwin Denby, two close friends, both Walker poets, gay, participants in the New York School of Poetry, and key critics of New York's painting and dance scenes as well, should have found such different verse styles to express their experience of the street. O'Hara's excitable lines, sometimes splayed all over the page like abstract expressionist drips, conjure up a sense of Times Square, where avenues converge triangularly. Simultaneity erupts from the corner of one's eye and, as he puts it, 
everything suddenly honks. Mm -hmm. Denby's more measured, benign descriptions of street life often are cast into sonnets whose formal lines suggest the orderly progression of walking at an even pace along the Manhattan grid. While the usual explanation for their stylistic discrepancy would be that the younger man, O'Hara, was simply the better, more innovative poet, and Denby the more old-fashioned, hobbyistic one, it could equally be argued that each is reflecting a different grasp of the city's form. In the 50s and early 60s, Frank O'Hara was working on a type of poem that would capture the sensation of walking around New York, noticing certain things, going inside one's head, coming out again, and recreating the push-pull tension between the two, all the while carrying it off with a breezy casualness that combined the dislocated collage techniques of the French, particularly Apollinaire, with the speed and democratic freshness of colloquial American, and with doses of that sub-dialect Allen Ginsberg once called gay talk, a sort of chatty brilliance with moments of bitch camp humor. And here's an example called Lana Turner Has Collapsed. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard, so it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood, there is no rain in California. I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. And oh, Lana Turner, we love you, get up. Get up, get up. The persona that O'Hara, who earned his living as a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, evolves for these lunch poems, as he called them, was less of the professional or romantic poet than of the nine to five upper echelon office worker who, quote, strolling through the noisy splintered glare of a Manhattan noon has paused at a sample Olivetti typewriter to type up 30 or 40 lines of ruminations while never forgetting to eat lunch, his favorite meal, unquote. Here is the opening of one of his best walk poems, A Step Away From Them. It's my lunch hour, so I go for a walk among the hung colored cabs, first down the sidewalk where laborers feed their dirty glistening torso sandwiches and Coca-Cola with yellow helmets on. They protect them from falling bricks, I guess, then onto the avenue where skirts are flipping above heels and blow up over grates. The sun is hot, but the cabs stir up the air, I look at bargains and wristwatches. There are cats playing in sawdust. On to Times Square, where the sign blows smoke over my head, and higher, the waterfall pours lightly. A Negro stands in the doorway with a toothpick languorously agitating. A blonde chorus girl clicks. He smiles and rubs his chin. Everything suddenly honks. It is 12.40 of a Thursday. The breathless use of enjambment suggests always being in the middle of a step. The visual device of starting each stanza just beyond the end of the previous line is like stepping off a curb. O'Hara's anti-rhetorical, throwaway, factual tone in this poem, which seizes on the charismatically jolly laid, grungy, working class look of New York's public space, seems the verbal equivalent of his photographic contemporaries, Robert Frank's documentary snapshots in the Americans, or John Cassavetti's grainy tracking shots of city walking and shadows. The poem goes in for a bit of positive racial stereotyping. Quote, there are several Puerto Ricans on the avenue today which makes it beautiful and warm, which can also be read as a progressive response to the city's changing demographics. As so often happens with O'Hara, the sensuality of street life makes him think of death. His friends, Bunny Lang, Jackson Pollock, and John Latouche have all recently passed away, and he wonders in an odd locution, but is the earth as full as life was full of them? It had better be. He walks further on, passes a warehouse, has a last glass of papaya juice, and, quote, back to work. My heart is in my pocket. It is poems by Pierre Reverdy. One notes that after all the democratic interest shown in New York streetscape, his jealously guarded interior life, his heart turns out to be a paperback of a French poet. In the end, O'Hara identifies himself more as a poet than white-collar worker, more as internationalist than New Yorker. There is also in these poems a strong sense of a you, 
a lover or friend or ideal reader or in crowd who is the intended beneficiary of his running commentary. So many of O'Hara's poems play with the epistolary form that even his walking poems may be seen as memos fired off from the sidewalk, dictated while on foot. Sad he may often be, but entirely solitary never. In the marvelous buoyant walk poem, Steps, his addressee is New York itself. And here's Steps. How funny you are today, New York, like Ginger Rogers in swing time and St. Bridget's steeple leaning a little to the left. Here I have just jumped out of a bed full of V-days. I got tired of D-days and blue you there still accepts me foolish and free. All I want is a room up there and you in it. And even the traffic called so thick is a way for people to rub against each other. And when their surgical appliances lock, they stay together for the rest of the day. What a day. I go by to check a slide and I say, that painting's not so blue. <laughs> Where's Lana Turner? She's out eating and garbles backstage at the Met. Everyone's taking their coat off so they can show a rib cage to the rib watchers. <laughs> and the park's full of dancers with their tights and shoes and little bags who are often mistaken for worker outers at the West Side Y. Why not? The Pittsburgh Pirates shout because they won. And in a sense, we're all winning. We're alive. The apartment was vacated by a gay couple who moved to the country for fun. They moved a day too soon. Even the stabbings are helping the population explosion, though in the wrong country. And all those liars have left the UN. The Seagram buildings no longer rivaled in interest. Not that we need liquor, we just like it. And the little box is out on the sidewalk next to the delicatessen so the old man can sit on it and drink beer and get knocked off it by his wife later in the day while the sun is still shining. Oh God, it's wonderful to get out of bed and drink too much coffee and smoke too many cigarettes and love you so much. The Day Lady Died is one of O'Hara's most celebrated poems. It shows how his diaristic method, what he called his I do this, I do that mode, could produce a masterpiece. This time the walking around structure is compressed and nourished by exceptional dramatic meat. The blasé persona of O'Hara's urbanite narrator checking his bank balance, contemplating a weekend freeloading in the Hamptons, buying liquor and cigarettes, is punished for his glibness, or at least chastened, by colliding with the tragic news via tabloid headline of the great Billy Holiday's death. The walk ends with a corpse, and the poet, sweating, remembers the last time he heard her at the far spot, while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Mal Waldron and everyone and I stopped breathing. O'Hara's own untimely death occurred in 1966, run over by the one motor vehicle on Fire Island. The ultimate indignity for a peripatetic writer. It leaves one wondering where else he might have taken the walking poem, which he had perfected had he lived on to a riper age. Edwin Denby, whose dates were 1903 to 1983, some 20 years older than Frank O'Hara, survived him by another 17 years. The finest dance critic this country has ever produced, Denby once gave a lecture in the early 60s to choreography students called Dancers, Buildings, and People in the Streets that remains a seminal document of walk literature. Denby was well aware of the informational overload problem of modern street life. He said, it is very exhausting to keep looking, of course, just as it is to keep doing anything else. And from an instinct of self-preservation, many people look only a little. One can get along perfectly well without looking much. You all know how very little one is likely to see happening on the street, a familiar street at a familiar time of day while one is using the street to get somewhere. So much is happening inside one, one's private excitements and responsibilities. One can't find the energy to watch the strangers passing by, or the architecture or the weather around. One feels there is a use in getting to the place one is headed for and doing something or other there, getting to a book or succeeding in a job or discussing a situation with a friend. All that has a use, but what is the use in looking at the momentary look of the street? Street of 106th and Broadway, no use at all. Nevertheless, he encourages the budding dancers to keep looking at the street for what he calls the dance of everyday life. He anatomizes with sharp descriptions the graceful walk of Caribbean blacks, the contrapposto stroll of Italians, the expansive largest space that American bodies claim, and the ladies entering a theater with half a drink too much. It should be mentioned in passing how much American choreography since the early 60s, Merce Cunningham, Yvonne Rayner, Tricia Brown, 
Jerome Robbins, even Balanchine, has been an attempt to get away from strained expressivity and to continue the rhythms of walking and everyday gestures into modern dance. Then Denby goes on to talk of the street in general, and it is this passage that I find so evocative in its total scanning. He says, daily life is wonderfully full of things to see, not only people's movements, but the objects around them, the shape of the rooms they live in, the ornaments architects make around windows and doors, the peculiar ways buildings end in the air, the water tanks, the fantastic differences in their street facades on the first floor. A French composer who was here said to me, I had expected the streets of New York to be monotonous after looking at a map of all those rectangles, but now I see the differences in height between buildings. I find I have never seen streets so diverse, one from another. But if you start looking at New York architecture, you will notice not only the sometimes extraordinary delicacy of the window framings, but also the standpipes, the grandiose plaques of granite and marble on ground floors of office buildings, the windowless sidewalls, the careful, those senseless marble ornaments, and then the masses, the way the office and factory buildings pile up together in perspective, and under them the drive of the traffic, those brilliantly colored trucks with their fanciful lettering, the violent paint on cars, signs, houses, as well as lips. Sunsets turn the red painted houses and the cross streets to the flush of live rose petals. In his verse, Denby put into practice the observation discipline his lecture recommended. Crowd, face, corner, sky, waterfront, the air and weather of the street. No other poet has written so eloquently about the atmospheric envelope above and about modern cities. This is especially true of his first collection, in public and private, with its sonnet sequence whose titles alone, The Climate, Standing on the Side Corner, A New York Face, The Subway, City Without Smoke, First Warm Days, convey his attempt to honor and update Whitman. Denby shared Whitman's liking for the democratic leveling of the street, saying, men of affairs whose self-importance looks jerky out of doors and the pleasures of anonymous cit citizenry, but he refused to spill into pantheistic euphoria. For him, New York is no city of orgies, but rather, he sees, like a worn down cafeteria fork. And here's a poem of his. Over Manhattan Island, when gales subside, inhuman colors of ocean afternoons, luminously livid, tear the sky so wide the exposed city looks like deserted dunes. Peering out the street, New Yorkers in saloons identify the smokeless moment outside, like a subway stop where one no longer stirs. Soon, this oceanic gracefulness will have died. For to city people, the smudgy film of smoke is reassuring, like an office. It's sociable, like money. It gives the sky a furnished look that makes disaster domestic, negotiable. Nothing to help society in the sky's grace, except that each looks at it with his mortal face. One more minute, okay. Um, well, that's it, thank you. <laughs> I suspect that in the Roughly 50 years that Marion Moore lived in New York, she never said, oh shit. Um, after uh, these descriptions of various men behaving badly um, in New York, enjoying louche, um, uh, fun, cough, too much coffee, gin, and cigarettes, it will be a challenge uh, to interest you in Marion Moore. Um, but I shall do my best um, with this woman who did live with her mother, who attended church every Sunday religiously, go to the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia, and one finds large folders on onion skin paper of Marion Moore's transcribed interpretations of the Bible lecture given after church. Um, at her local, at her local church. Um, Marion Moore was an enthusiastic zoo-goer, a museum frequenter, a shopper. She loved Wanamaker's in particular, but to be honest, she, uh, 
could make do with a card catalog. Give Marion Moore just one drawer of the card catalog, and that sufficed for gin and cigarettes uh, for her. Zoos, museums, card catalogs have something in common with the city, the city of New York in particular, as Marion Moore loved and understood it. That is, these are institutions, organizations, artifacts of human culture that provide access, that bring what is far away close, um, and that uh, bring before, br before us um, uh, instances of evolved or fashioned craft of either the mind in its um, complex uh, snail-like <laughs> crawlings over the surface of the earth in the case of the card catalog uh, or of flesh evolving uh, in response to exigencies in the case of the animals one finds in the zoo. More delighted in and uh, included in her poems as much detail of uh, the uh, world made, she believed, by a creator and then by those uh, sentient animals uh, made in her creator's image. She's a poet of, you see what I mean uh, when I say uh, this is not uh, a poet who in 50 years, even in the wicked city, New York, would have been likely to say, oh shit. Um, she would, however, um, write such copious letters as uh, the, ex, as the few I'll, I'll read a f uh, some excerpts from, uh, letters that will, I, I hope, ground what, will, um, what I'll go on to uh, describe in her wonderful poem, wonderful, somewhat difficult poem, New York. Here's a letter from um, shortly after she arrived in New York um, with her mother. And like uh, all of us who arrive in New York, whether for the first time or as I did on the train today for the 100th or 200th, uh, the experience, the, the sheer impact of all the access um, strikes one. You hit the pavement and around you uh, within three minutes walk is more of everything. Uh, than you um, get in your life in Ohio or even in Boston um, over the course of several weeks. Here's Marion Moore sharing um, her uh, delighted that a friend of hers uh, has so enjoyed New York. Uh, and then Marion Moore following out a, um, uh, a, a moment of contact over New York as one would follow out, sort of as we do from link to link on the internet, uh, as she would follow card to card in the card catalog. I am so glad that you like New York. I feared that you might begin to find it humdrum before you left for California. My mother and I were not in Santa Barbara, but I can see it perfectly from your picture. I hope you have found Carmel a great contrast and that you have been able to wear your riding breeches and do as you please. Have you found any horses? I cannot imagine anything more delightful than riding through the woods by the sea in California unless it were to look at the elephants of which you speak in Carthage. I hope that I give a false impression of myself in my poems for there is nothing I love more than the concrete and there is an especial romance, I think, about elephants. I have a Kodak picture of one, a princess's elephant, on which a friend of mine went sightseeing in Gwalior, with a bell hung against its side by a cord which runs from the front to the hind legs and a checked cloth on its head. I set a great store by it. Of course I like the gazelles too, and I have had so much curiosity about the world before the fish age that I am pleased to have reminded you of it. That's a long excursus of the kind um, that one often finds in Moore, uh, whose putative subject may in fact be New York. 
Um, uh, on uh, a, a year or two later, we have more um, writing to a friend about uh, the newest goods in the stores and her experience watching Pavlova. The shops have tried to look wintry and austere, but have ex succeeded only in being dull. The hats are dowdy, as if they had been unintentionally crushed, and everything seems to be peppered with beads. I saw at Wanamaker's today a piece of pale gray pane velvet with a minute design of rather large palm leaves in gold thread. And Bernard had some a time ago, a crinoline, heliotrope, and silver flexible cloth, just heavy enough to hang perpendic perpendicular. But even these are stereotyped. A small crinoline extension, I mean, and the Pavlova skirts were not crinoline, but hoopsters, and you can see there you can hear there, I hope, Moore's interest in the craft of dressmaking uh, in, and in finding language adequate to the stuffs uh, that she sees in the stores. Even if the, fat, even if the cut and the tailoring is uninteresting, there's still, still something to be observed in the, um, in the dress goods. Now here she's at the ballet. Pavlova is here, and we saw her last week in Amarillia. First, there was a minuet with girls in pink silk crinolines with red rosettes on their skirts and red heels and a marquee in a pink crinoline with silver bodice and a peacock blue ostrich feather, flowers and fringe on the skirt, pink slippers with blue heels and a black tricorn hat edged with blue fringe. That hat that eventually Moore adopted herself and wore everywhere. Pavlova was a gypsy exhibited by mountebanks, some in green tights and red boots, some in red tights and yellow boots. They tossed each other about with great skill, I thought, when you consider how hard it is to carry people, let alone throw them a distance. Um, and just one more letter to just give you the flavor of Moore's prose, uh, since her poetry um, uh, is famously um, uh, prosy, um, written in sentences. This is many years later. She's thanking Lincoln Kirstein, who has um, obtained some excellent tickets for her to a performance of one kind or another. Um, Moore's capacity to appreciate um, uh, an experience and to feel grateful for all, every, for access to every aspect of it, here includes the, lady, the ladies room of the theater and its attendant. Um, her joy uh, in the ladies' room, I, I suspect, is, uh, is, a, is, is she caught. She's giddy after the experience at the mezzanine window. I went to the side mezzanine ticket window, got there by a quarter of two, and was handed a ticket instantly with a little yes sir looking for you cordial nod. And let me say, I think that the washroom facilities and matron and the facilities home done enameled look do the center the utmost credit. So, <laughs> um, so there is, uh, and this is typical of Moore, who when she describes a day at the zoo will also describe the lunch eaten, the uh, precise angle of the light coming through the trees, whether or not the paper bag in which the lunch was packed was ripped, um, whether or not she and Mama were capable of saving it for the next such picnic. Um, an exacting and um, meticulous attention to detail, uh, you've probably caught on, is um, trademark more. Um, I've brought you, risking pedantry, um, an actual poem, which I suspect many of you have. You may, do enough of you have it that some of you, that some representative sample can look at it? I hope so. Um, you, I, I've also brought you uh, more looking fetching, virgin, uh, spinster that uh, she is. Um, um, Kenneth Burke said that her, her celibate status notwithstanding, she was the most sensual woman he'd ever known. Um, uh, so you can see I'm trying to compete with, uh, with the fellows. Uh, in any case, I've brought you this wonderful poem uh, by Moore uh, called New York. Not an, not an easy poem, uh, but an interesting one that connects the New York of uh, the modern day, the mo New York of, of Moore's modern day of 1921, with earlier New Yorks, with Cooper's New York, 
uh, in particular, with it, and uh, therefore but with, up, with upstate New York. I, just before coming here, I walked into the uh, lobby of the Empire State Building and was reminded how little Moore liked the idea of empire. Um, how she, uh, one of the um, Bible texts that most interested her was the story of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and she uh, uh, particularly worried and feared about uh, America's overreaching and in fact about the overreaching of imperial cultures everywhere. This is a poem um, that um, shares some love and uh, Moore's trademark gusto for what there is to enjoy um, for the kind of access uh, New York gives while also uh, throwing up red flags and cautionary uh, warnings against uh, New York chauvinism. Um, there are few poems in the uh, modernist period that have actually a bottom line that um, says what uh, the poem is about, but I've brought you one that I think um, does have such a bottom line, that is, uh, it's two bottom lines, in fact, the two bottom lines of the poem. The two last lines of the poem, uh, which I'll read for those of you who don't have it, are, uh, it is not the plunder, but accessibility to experience. And now I'll read the whole poem. New York, the savage's romance, accreted where we need the space for commerce the center of the wholesale fur trade, starred with teepees of ermine and peopled with foxes, the long guard hairs waving two inches beyond the body of the pelt, the ground dotted with deerskins, white with white spots, as satin needlework in a single color may carry a varied pattern, and wilting eagles down, compacted by the wind, and picardelles of beaver skin, white ones alert with snow. It is a far cry from the queen full of jewels and the bow with the muff, from the gilt coach shaped like a perfume bottle to the conjunction of the Monongahela and the Allegheny and the scholastic philosophy of the wilderness. It is not the, dimes, the dime novel exterior Niagara Falls, the calico horses in the war canoe. It is not that if the fur is not finer than such as one sees others wear, one would rather be without it. That estimated in raw meat and berries could feed the universe. It is not the atmosphere of ingenuity, the otter, the beaver, the puma skins without shooting irons or dogs. It is not the plunder but accessibility to experience. A first key to this admittedly uh, difficult poem comes in the fact that the last line is a quotation. Time's up? <laughs> Time's up. Huh. One minute. <laughs> Let. Hmm. All right. Uh, the last line is a quotation. It's a quotation from Henry James, uh, and it, uh, who, uh, who loved New York too for the accessibility to experience it provided. That every insight, that all value comes from somewhere, depends on something, bears a set of debts and relations, um, is, um, dramatized in the fact that uh, Moore ends with a quotation. Her, her poem depends upon Henry James uh, as, in fact, New York, the city, center of the wholesale fur trade, depends not only upon upstate and the animals brought to New York to be sold there, uh, but upon a wider American geography 
uh, and in fact a um, uh, more diverse natural world even than New York. And had I time, I would talk to you about fur, but um, I do not. <laughs> Carmen Cita. I'm going to do Nueva York in Espanol. As you all know, for nearly all its history, there's been tremendous interaction between New York City and the Spanish speaking world deep trading connections to Caribbean and South America have ensured constant stream of visitors here for business, pleasure, or seeking refuge. With them have come a vast array of poets. They've been here as diplomats, as businessmen, as lovers, as tourists, as students, as is the case of Garcia Lorca, as journalists, as is the case of Jose Martin initially. They've been here looking for love, like Salomón de la Selva, who had an affair with Edna Saint Millet, or Salvador Novo, another gay Latin American poet that came here to enjoy the gay world, much more open than in our countries, or the Spaniard Juan Ramón Jiménez that came to get married here with Zenaida, the love of his life, the mother of Zenaida had brought her to New York to split her from that not very good match, just a poet who became a Nobel Prize later on. And they got married at St. Stephen. Um, others have been here because they want to make movies. That's the case of Vicente Guidobro, the Chilean poet, a celebrity, a star, maybe you haven't heard of him. For us, he's uh, very well known a millionaire, founder not only of one, but of several avant-garde movements, friend of Picasso, of Tritzan Sara, Eric Satie, Jean Cocteau, André Breton, Miró. He comes here after winning a $10,000 prize for a novel called, or kind of novel, very avant-garde, called Cagliostro, that he wrote for his Romanian film director friend, Mime Tzu. And here he was introduced to Charles Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Gloria Swanson, who enthusiastically want, wanted to be part of his project. Others have been here for media exposure. This is the case of Octavio Paz. He was here during the early 80s, always the same days of the year at the Drake Hotel waiting for the news of the Nobel Prize. When he finally got it, he wasn't in New York. Bad luck. <laughs> Others came as tourists of society, like the sisters Ocampo, Silvina and Victoria Ocampo. Silvina is a wonderful poet. They went for dinner at the Vanderbilts before the house, the mansion, was destroyed in Fifth Avenue. Not all of them encountered New York City in their poems, but many did. I am going to drop here a few in a rough chronological order. The first is Jose Martí, <clears throat> the Cuban poet, political activist, and a national hero. He lived the third part of his life here in New York. Here he did his best as a journalist, an op-ed writer, translator, editor, diplomat. He was the consul of Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay simultaneously, and as well as a poet. Published here his two most important books of poetry. But most of his poems don't look at the city, seem to ignore New York City. There's one memorable dated in New York City in 1882 that's called Amor de Ciudad Grande, Love in a Big City, not New York only, but any big city. It's a long, delicious no poem. I'm only going to drop some verses here. Jaula es la villa de palomas muertas y ávidos cazadores. The city is the cage of dead pigeons and avid hunters. 
se ama de pie en las calles entre el polvo de los salones y las plazas. Muere la flor el día en que nace. The flower dies the day's been born. Um, the next poet is Rubén Darío. In 1893, uh, Rubén Darío is our most beloved poet. He literally shook and filled of new life the tree of poetry written in Spanish. He met, in 1893, he met José Martí here in New York, and he called him father. He didn't really like New York, though sometimes he loved it. He was very ambivalent about it. Um, he wrote, I'm going to say, the evil part in Spanish. No quiero estar de parte de esos búfalos de dientes de plata. Son enemigos míos. Son los aborrecedores de la sangre latina. Son los bárbaros. Which is something like, uh, I don't want to be nearby those buffaloes of silver teeth. They are my enemies. They are the haters of the Latino blood. They are the barbarians. But a bit later, he changed his mind and he wrote, Welcome, magical eagle. In your beak is the olive blank of a vast and fertile peace. In 1914, he visited the city again, and he wrote a long poem to New York. It's called La Gran Cosmopolis. Homes in a 50-story high-rise, a serving class of color, millions of people circumcised, machines, billboards, newspapers, and grief, layer upon layer. So there must be the strong men who spread their golden needs and multiply their seed with the cycle plan fervor, while all along Fifth Avenue, misery is in full view and grief layer upon layer. I know there's glory and pleasure at the Waldorf Astoria in good measure, where there's lots of treasure, love, triumph, the rich getting richer. But on the bank by the river, the dying are cold and shiver, and worse still, God lives here in grief, layer upon layer, etc. The next poet you have all heard about him is Federico Garcia Lorca. He arrived in 1929 in the twin brother of the Titanic, the Olympia. He came to study English at Columbia University. He didn't learn English, by the way. Instead, he wrote one of the most extraordinary New Yorker poetry books, Poeta en Nueva York. For the first time, a Spanish-speaking poet makes the city its theme and its obsession. Ian Gibson, his biographer, wrote that the major literary influence of the young Garcia Lorca was Rubén Darío. If not Darío, not nor his father hadn't used their pens to draw the city, Darío's son would do it for him. We have there a father, a son, and a grandson. I am going just to drop some of the verses of Garcia Lorca. Dawn in New York has four columns of slime and a hurricane of black pigeons that splash about in the putrid waters. New York of slime, New York of wire and death. Dawn in New York moans up and down the immense fire escapes, seeking among the aries nards of anguish designed. From another poem, every day in New York they kill four million dogs, five million pigs, two thousand pigeons for the pleasure of the dying, a million cows, a million lambs, and two million roosters. And another one in which also he points the a violence he sends in the city. The children pounded little squirrels with a flush of tainted frenzy. In 1943, Pablo Neruda, who was born in Chile in 1904, Nobel Prize of Literature too, travels to New York, invited to read at La Voz de las Américas. I guess that was when he imagined the poem he entitled in English, Walking Around, just the first verses. It happens that I'm tired of being a man. 
It happens that I go into the tailor's shops and the movies all shriveled up, impenetrable, like a felt swan navigating on a water of origin and ash. The smell of barber shops makes me sob out loud, etc. We remember him, him in Latin America strolling around in 1966 in New York with Arthur Miller. It's an image we all, we all keep in, a gossip we all keep in our minds for one little detail. He was very pompous, very elegant, always wore a jacket. And when we, he was strolling around with Arthur Miller, he did not. He was in mangas de camisa. Also in 1945, Octavio Paz the Nobel Prize, the Mexican Nobel Prize, was here. He was working in the Mexican Consulate of New York. And New York was a very significant part of his world. Not that he wrote long poems about New York, not even a complete poem on New York, but he included New York in his major poems. In Himno Entre Ruinas, Coronado de sí, el día extiende sus plumas, alto grito amarillo, caliente surtidor en el centro de un cielo imparcial y benéfico, that he dated in Naples in 1948. New York is the second city mentioned. The first one is Tenochtitlan. The third one is London. The fourth is Moscow. In other of his major poems, Piedra de Sol, he again mentions New York, not now the name of the city, but only a street. It's, he says, was, it, was, was I planning for summer's coming and all coming summers in Christopher Street? This was 10 years ago, with Phyllis in the bright hollows of those throats, the sparrows would come to drink, drinking the light. For all these poets I've mentioned, the city has been a place, New York City has been a place where they've grown or their imagination has grown, not for Julia de Burgos. Julia de Burgos, probably the major woman poet of Puerto Rico, moved to New York in 1940. She would live here the rest of her life with the exception of two short periods, one in Cuba and the second in DC. But unlike the others, as I said, she didn't live her best years in the city. Her, her health was destroyed by her alcoholism. She ended living like a bomb, hanged around the streets of East Harlem, where she died, and her corpse was unrecognized and was sent to the common grave. Later, they recovered it and sent, was sent to Puerto Rico, where she was buried with nation honors. But there's a legend that I treasure enormously. The legend says that when she died, her legs had to be cut to make her fit in the coffin because she was very tall and she couldn't fit. It's proof that it's only a lie, but as all legends, it does have a meaning. Julia de Burgos did not fit in New York. She was mutilated here. She wrote in 1953, Farewell from Welfare Island, in English, dropping her Spanish, her language. It has to be from here, forgotten but unshaken, among comrades of silence, deep into Welfare Island, my farewell to the world. She lost all the power in, in the city. Before she had written, Ya las gentes murmuran que soy tu enemiga porque dicen que en el verso doy al mundo mi yo. Already the people murmur that I'm your enemy because they say that in verse I give the world my me. They lie, Julia de Burgos. They lie, Julia de Burgos, etc. I'm losing my time. Well, I was, going to, I was going to read the last poem of an Ecuadorian poet that lives here, has been living here for 10 years. He was born in 1943 in Bolivia. He wrote a wonderful book published only a year and a half ago called El Paraguas de Manhattan, The Umbrella of Manhattan. But I'm going to leave it for another occasion. Thank you very much. Iwan? Well, the Ochavaur am a Guahodiat, I thought the Evrog name with 
i Gymrhan and uh, People's Poetry Gathering. Thank you very much for the invitation to come to New York to take part in the People's Poetry Gathering from Wales. And there are a few of us here. I don't know if there's anyone here tonight. I'm going to be reading two poems. Um, I'll read both in Welsh and then in English. The first one is called Far Rockaway. And the first time I came to New York, about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, I flew into JFK and friends of mine were meeting me there. And we took a train intending to come into Manhattan. <laughs> but we found ourselves in Far Rockaway. And we didn't stay there very long at the time. I don't know, maybe it's changed. I mean, New York has changed in 10 years, but we didn't want to hang around. But um, the name really got me, you know, Far Rockaway. And since I've written this poem, I've learned that Ferlinghetti has written about Far Rockaway and Miloslav Holub has written about Far Rockaway. So there must be something about Far Rockaway that gets poets going. So anyway... I'll be reading in Welsh to begin with, and then a translation by uh, Robert Minhinik, who's also over here and who will be reading during this uh, event. Far Rockaway. Dwi'n fynd a thi i Far Rockaway. Far Rockaway. Mae enw'r chen gitar yn fy mhen, yn gor o rhythmau haf a llanw'r mor, yn sgwrs cariadon dros goffi cri, ar ôl taith drwy'r nos mewn pick-up di. Yn ogla petrol ar ôl glaw, yn chwilio'r lleiad law yn llaw, yn hela brogawod ar y gemffordd wleb yn wefr o fod yn nabod neb. Dwi am fynd â thi i Far Rockaway, Far Rockaway. Lle mae cwr yn ein golchi thraed yn mydreddu'r traeth ac yn ffeirio hwy angerddi ffraeth. Lle mae enfys y graffiti'n ffyn rhwng y waliau noeth a'r hael mawr blin. Lle mae'r trac yn teithio'r llwybr cyl rhwng gwen o sadwn a gwg y sil a nina ein dau yn rhan ei baich, ein cyfrinachau fraich ymraich. Dwi am fynd â thi i Far Rockaway, Far Rockaway. Lle mae heddlu'r dre yn sgwennu cerddi wrth ddisgwyl tren ac yn sgwrsio hefo'i gynnau'n glen. Lle mae'r beirdd ar ei hystolion tal yn cynganeddu ar bedair wal yn yfed wisgi hefo glith yn chwarae gwyddbwyll a'i llaw chwyth. Mae cysan hir yn enw'r lle. Far rock away. Far rock away. And this is Robert's uh, translation. It's not a translation, it's his version of, of the poem. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Far rock away. Though it's far away, I will follow, you will follow me down to far rock away, far rock away. Its name sings golden as guitar strings or a street choir becoming an ocean. Or lovers who have turned in here off the night's turnpike whispering over black coffee, gasoline and fine rain on their clothes, two moon watchers touching fingertips, counting back the back road's road kill, certain there's been no one like them before. Though it's far away, will you follow me down to Far Rock Away, Far Rock Away, where stars change places above the bay and the air is filled with acid lullabies, where graffiti paints its rainbow over every brownstone neighbourhood. And even Saturn aliens have understood that soon they must turn home like rats under the subway track and where the two of us walk city streets carrying each other and our secrets. And though it's far away, will you follow me down to Far Rock Away, Far Rock Away, where, as they're waiting for the A-train, the NYPD will write love songs about the good karma loaded in their guns. And the bads will vote on vowels from their bar stools, mixing dew and dewers over left-handed chess. And all seek the consecration of a kiss to
today in Far Rockaway, Far Rockaway. <laughs> uh, one more poem. Uh, it's not exactly about New York, but it's not far away in American terms. Uh, when I came here that time, th those first visits, uh, we visited the Harley Davidson factory just outside Philadelphia. And we were filming for a Welsh language program in, in Wales. And we got a tour of the, of the factory and we were tourists, you know, we were real tourists, dressed up like tourists. And all these guys and girls were building these machines, which are part of the American dream, for me anyway, you know. And I got thinking there when I was watching these guys working and, and slaving and sweating over their machines. There's a castle in North Wales called Carnarvon Castle, which is uh, probably the biggest castle in Wales, if not Britain, built by the English to suppress the Welsh. And the Welsh built that castle themselves. They were slave labour. They built the castle. They forced them to build the castle. And this poem talks about that those two things, maybe. I don't know. It's also a tourist, you know, place now. I'll do the same. I'll read it in Welsh to begin with and then in English. Halley Davidson. Mae o'n ddiwyd diant erbyn hyn, cynhyrchu'r freidwyd. Yn llond ffatri o ddynion a merched blinedig, yn chwysu o'ch y periannau, yn ysu am hanner awr ginio, yn rhegi'r polisi dim smocio, yn herio'r diwylliant corfforaethol, yn cynllunio'n ymdebol, yn gwylio'n chweru a chwylfrydig wrth i ni, y twristiau dillad haf ddod i chwylio'r freidwyd. Dydion rhyfedd, ystyriwch y peth, saith canrwyf yn ôl bu cofis dre, yn crymyd a'n bwysau meini'r saith, an ail drefnis bwriel chys chywelyn yw godin gair yn arfon, er mwyn i ni heddiw farchnata at feilion eu llafur. A dyma ni nai, yng ngwlad yr oddewid yn gwylio'r gweithlu yn cynhyrchu breuddwydion. Nid yn eu cipio'r awyr fel cymylau, na'i dal, dal fel dail yn disgyn o ganghennau yr awen, ond yn mynd ar eu gliniau yn gosod plygiau, yn cysylltu gwifrau, yn rhoi sbardyn dan olwynion, yn gosod teiar a ffendar a ffwar at ei gilydd, yn tanio periannau'r freidwyd, yn gyrru grym drwy cherbyd, yn beiddi dwylo, yn heneiddio'n ifanc, yn fudur gan olew a saim a siomiant, a syrffed y linell gynhyrchu, a geto'n hanner balch, hanner bodlon, wrth weld yr olwynion yn troi, yn troi'r ffantys i'n ffaith. Wrth weld y freidwyd yn clido un cwsmer hapus arall i holltu'r gwynt a'r Harley Davidson dros bond to porth aer. Entirely an industry to process a dream. A plant full of pissed off men and women, their perspiration on the chrome, their willing on of the dinner break, their cursing the no smoking ordinance, they're capping at all the corporate bullshit. They're planning, they're organizing, they're looking at us as if to ask who the hell we think we are, the visitors in leisure wear come to ride the illusion. But it's not so unusual. Consider this. Seven centuries back, the Welsh were blue-collar workers riding pillion in their own backyard, sifting the rubble of their leaders' forts to build English castles so that today we make big business of our ruin. And now here we are in a promised land, watching drones deliver dreams. But where's the inspiration? The lightning trees unstruck, so they're down on their knees, fixing spark plugs, connecting wires with tires and pistons, joining one thing to another, so that lo and behold, the dream is firing on every cylinder. And though there's a grime of oil and grease and disappointment blackening the hands, exhausting the young, any shifts half proud despite itself when the fantastic wheels start turning. Because the axe stroke of a Harley along the Golden Gate Bridge means another tourist rolling off the assembly line. <laughs> Thank you.
And now for the uh, Lightning Mini Film Festival portion. Um, we can just roll them, or do you want to give a quick uh, introduction? Well, maybe as we're lo lowering this, the uh, screen, I'll just mention that this uh, first one was made in 1983, when New York City actually owned its own public television station, WNYC, and I was commissioned to create a series of poetry spots that went in between the British soap operas that were running. Uh, Allen Ginsberg was living on, in his apartment on East 12th Street and uh, was dreaming of living in a loft, which right before he died, he was able to sell his papers to Stanford and buy uh, the loft where his Tai Chi could take up enough room. Uh, gosh, that was such a good segue. Cue the buffalo. And it's, uh, you know, the series.
Poet, professor in autumn years, seeks helpmate, companion, protector, friend, young lover with empty, compassionate soul, athletic physique and boundless mind, courageous warrior who may also like women and girls, no problem, to share bed, meditation, apartment, Lower East Side, help inspire mankind, conquer world, anger, and guilt, empowered by Whitman, Blake, Rambo, Ma Rainey, and Vivaldi. Familiar, respecting art's primordial majesty, priapic, carefree, playful, harmless slave or master, mortally tender, passing swift time. Photographer, musician, painter, poet, yuppie, or scholar. Find me here in New York, alone with the alone, going to Lady Psychiatrist who says, make time in your life for someone you can call darling, honey, who holds you dear, can get excited and lay his head on your heart in peace. Okay, and that's the end of uh, that one. It was uh, directed by Mark. Uh, uh, for just about five minutes uh, for uh, questions. So if we have somebody who wants to grab a mic on either side, or if you want to bellow from where you are, uh, we have time for just a, a couple. Or, seeing none, yes, okay. Eduardo Mitre. M-I-T-R-E is his last name, and Eduardo the first name. He was born in 1943 in Bolivia. Yes. In my last book of poems, I did, um, it's my Brooklyn Night uh, book. It's um, one of the poems, it's a very long poem, 112 pages long. It's called Los Nuevos. And I kind of compare Brooklyn with Mexico City and other parts of Mexico like Cholula, the amount of churches. And it's um, a, a poem comparing and also uh, encountering Brooklyn, my, my neighborhood. I'm obsessed with Brooklyn now. Also, my, my new novel that will appear next month, Galis are correct, that the cover is ready, everything is ready, is also my Brooklynite novel. <laughs>